Do you remember what it was like to sit in church at their age? I was thinking about that this week as I was thinking about Christian Education Sunday and what that means and those experiences that each of us had. And I thought about my first memory at church. I grew up for at least a short part of my time growing up in a little town called Medicine Lodge, Kansas. And I attended the First United Methodist Church there. And this was before my mom was actually involved as a Christian education person. So at that time, church was brand new. And one of my earliest memories of church is sitting in the pews and not having carpet, which as a kid, you like carpet. Because I remember sitting there, and I'm short anyway, but even as a child, I can remember sitting there and my feet not touching the ground. And I'm trying to sit still because my mom has told me that if I'm not quiet and I don't sit still, I'm going to be in trouble after church. If, anybody, if, the, if any of the women look back at me, I'm in trouble. And so I'm trying really hard to stay still, and my feet are moving because I can't help it. You know how you try real hard not to move, and then suddenly every bone in your body starts aching, and you feel like you have to move. So there I am in my little patent shoes, which back then had the little buckles across. And they didn't quite have a heel, but they had a little stump on them. They're not heels, but we wore those a lot. And so there I am, barely able to touch the ground, and my feet are making this loud noise. <laughs> and the ladies look at me, and I get myself in trouble. Those were the first memories I have of actually sitting in worship. But do you remember what it was like? Do you remember what it was like to come to vacation Bible school and go to Sunday school? Some of us have good memories of that, and others of us can remember when we have to recite Bible verses word by word, and maybe we didn't decide to recite them until five minutes before it's our turn. Some of you probably remember what that's like. Well, if you can't remember, I have a picture, if we can bring up the first one. This is a picture of our church, and I'm not sure what the year is. We were talking about this this morning. We don't know if it was the 60s or the 70s, but we thought we saw a few people in there from this congregation that we knew, and we're not quite sure. But as you look at this picture of our church before it burnt down in the 80s, what do you think was going through their mind? What vision did they have for their church? What vision did they have for their children and their grandchildren? What's going through their mind? What are they thinking that the church is going to be like in 10 years, in 20 years, in 50 years? Any of you that are sitting here, do you remember this picture? Do you remember the hopes and dreams? Mike says he does. you remember that picture, Mike? Yeah, I do. And you said it was the 60s or 70s. It was back in the 50s. Okay, the 50s. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, I'm old. It's the 50s. Yeah, I remember that. And you're in that picture, Mike? Yeah, somewhere, but I can't find myself. <laughs> <laughs> As you look at that picture, though, even if you're not in that picture, Think about the hopes and dreams you've had for your church, that you've had for your children, that you have for your grandchildren. And if you don't have children or grandchildren, that you have for our children here in our church. Let's go to the next one. Anybody recognize anybody in that picture? I believe that's Lori <laughs> Vandivaldi on the front row. What was going through their minds? as they sat there listening to Connie Kelsey, and I'm not sure who that is, if that's the pastor or if that's someone else. What were those children thinking as they sat there? What memories did they have of being in our church? And I bet if we were to ask Lori Van Miller later, she could probably tell us, maybe not of this exact day, but she probably has memories of this church. One more. And then there's the Christmas program. And I'm assuming this is in the 80s, but again, I'm not sure. And the only person I can recognize from that is Regina Kantmeyer. I'm not sure who those others are, and maybe you all know. But what was going through their minds? Do you remember what it was like to be in a Christmas program? 
especially our Christmas program. Do you remember the excitement of putting on the costumes, celebrating Jesus, all the fun that we experience? That's all the pictures I have. Thank you. Christian education. It isn't just about memorizing Bible verses or getting up on Sunday morning because mom told us we have to go to Sunday school. It's about the memories that we hold. And as we look at those pictures, if we look at other pictures, one of them that I almost put up but I decided not to was of our picture burn, of our church burning. Over in my office, I found in my office the photo album that has the pictures of not only these back when our church was getting going, not at the very beginning, but we also have pictures of the fire. And I decided not to put those pictures up because I know that for many of you, that, that holds very painful memories. And you all remember that fire, more so than those of us that weren't here for that. What were you thinking as that church was burning? See, you weren't just saying goodbye and mourning the loss of a building. You were mourning the loss of the memories that took place in that building. You were mourning Christian education formation that happened within this building. We could be any building in Silver Lake, but we're not. We're the Silver Lake United Methodist Church. And with that comes memories of all kinds of things that we do here. When I think of how important Christian education is, it's easy to kind of say, eh, Christian education, it's so boring. You're just, the kids will say, well, we memorize Bible verses, and you know, the word is kind of a boring word. But look at all the experiences that, that encompasses. As I looked through that photo album the other day, there was pictures of a reenactment of the Last Supper. There was pictures of John Rick and someone else outside with the kids for vacation Bible school underneath the tent. There were pictures of United Methodist women doing what they love to do the most, which is to cook and to provide food and love and hospitality to our children and our congregation in the kitchen. And they were all smiling the kids were smiling. That's what I think of of Christian education. It's more than just Bible verses, which are important, and the stories are important to learn. Sometimes I think we take for granted the Christian education, not just as our church, but as a society. I think about my own beginning on how I got on this path of working with children and youth. You all know that my passion for this job started in campus ministry in high school. But when I was a junior in college, I was asked if I would consider being a youth director for a small, teeny tiny church in Dunlap, Kansas. Janet knows where that's at. Does anybody else know where Dunlap, Kansas is? I know the Braves know because they were close to there in Americas. Dunlap doesn't have much. They didn't have a post office. They didn't really have a main street. It was kind of like a little corner. But they had a big white church. And so I'm told it was also one of the first places that the first African American uh, school was as well. And I'm not sure about that. But Dunlap didn't have very many. And when I was asked to be the youth person for that church, I was excited. I was a junior in college. I didn't really have a clue what I was going to do. At that time, I didn't even want to be in youth ministry or ministry at all. I was going to be a teacher. But I thought, this would be a good experience for an internship. I can handle this. The first time I went to Dunlap, to get there, you have to take county roads. And you all know how I am with county roads and no GPS. <laughs> Dunlap is kind of down on the river bottom. And it's probably not five, seven miles from Council Grove, Kansas. You have to go on these back roads to get there. And from Emporia, you definitely had to go on back roads. And as I would drive there, it was, it was very pretty in the morning. I'd have to leave early in the morning. My first experience there, as I got there, I noticed that there was only maybe at the most 20 people in worship, all of them over the age of 50, except maybe two, most of them in their 70s. 
And on the front row of the pew was 15 children between the ages of 2 and 15. And my first thought was, wow, they have, old, they have children a lot older in age here. These parents are kind of older for these kids. They're all over 60. And as I sat there, and as I thought more about it, and as I experienced worship, I discovered that the parents didn't go to worship. In fact, after worship, I overheard one of the women from the United Methodist Women say, Okay, James, let's take you home. Don't forget, I'll be at your house next Sunday. I'm picking you up at 8 o'clock. Don't be late. We'll have breakfast. We're having pancakes and sausage. See you there. What I quickly discovered is in the small town of Dunlap, there was a lot of drugs. There was a lot of families that were low income. And there weren't very many of those families that attended church. But that little church took it upon themselves to make sure that they reached out to these children who may or may not be getting breakfast on the weekend. And to get them to church, they would go and they would pick them up, they would bring them back to the church, they would feed them breakfast, and then they would send them into church slash children's church. It was quite a sight to see that many kids. And it reminded me that we are all called to be part of this ministry. When I first when I first took on my first week or two there, I quickly discovered very quickly that these kids did not have a lot of Bible knowledge at all. They didn't have any knowledge on what it was like to even sit through church. And part of that was because they didn't go to church. They started out and then at children's time they went away, but they didn't know any of the sacraments of they didn't know what sacraments were, they didn't know what communion was, they didn't know how to sit still in church, they didn't know they had to be quiet during church. And so suddenly, over the next couple months, and Gerald and I were dating at that time, and he would help me with that, we taught them what it was like. I quickly learned that I couldn't take a Bible, a regular Bible, and have them be able to understand it. We had to go to children's picture Bibles and start there. And yes, this is even with my junior high and high school, some of them. We take for granted exactly how good of a Christian education program we have. We take for granted the fact that there are so many kids out there that don't know who Christ is, that doesn't know who God is, that doesn't know the stories of Jesus. Well, over the next two years, I continued in that church, and the first time that I had youth group there, I remember it was 6 o'clock in the evening, and the other thing about Dunlop, everyone told me, it's a farming community. Those that live there were farming. But as I mentioned before, there were lots of drugs and things, and they would warn me, and you all know how I'm stubborn and independent, but they would tell me, be sure that you don't stay too long after dark. And be sure that you go to Emporia and you go to Americas and you don't stop anywhere in between. There's nowhere to stop. But, but don't get a flat tire and don't, don't have any of that because you're going to see things on the way. And I did. Several times as I went back and forth, I saw drug handoffs taking off in fields. And some of them were kids that I had in school. I got more training for youth ministry in that two years than I had in my entire 14 years of youth ministry. One time, um, we were taking a youth, we were taking the youth to bowling, and on the way home, I got a call, or I got flagged down by a state trooper, and he told me not to take one of my students home, because there had been an accident in his house. And I didn't know exactly what that meant, so we continued on, and the pastor at the time, I met up with her, and it turned out that his mother had committed suicide, and I was the one that was with him for those moments. I hadn't had any youth ministry training, I hadn't had any training with what to deal with these kind of issues and trauma. It was an eye-opener for me. But it is what started my passion for working with children and working with young adults. This is where it all began. But I'm standing before you here today to remind you, since we are a congregation that loves sports, God 
doesn't call us to be bench warmers. God calls us to get in the game. And each of us have the capabilities and the gifts to do something. And maybe it's not standing up in front of a class and teaching them. Maybe that's not your thing. Maybe it's not standing up here and preaching. But find something that you can do. Find a gift that God has given you and share it with others. Maybe it's being a partner, an, an intergenerational partner with our children and our youth and spending time with them in an activity. And it's not just about the women. I want to be really clear on that. This is also for the men, too. What are things that you all can do? Do you remember when we used to do Friday Fun Night? And I'm not saying we should do that, but do you remember <laughs> when we did Friday Fun Night and we had 80 kids here? 80 kids, and many of you that are sitting back there, you remember that. We had sewing and crafts, and the men did woodwork and cooking and Bible stories and drama and just fun. Those are the things our kids are going to remember. Those are the things that make a difference in our children's lives. What vision do you have for our children, our grandchildren, our children here in this congregation, our children around the world? What can you do to foster them and to love them? You all have memories of people that have made a difference in your life as I have memories of people that have made a difference in mine. I can remember youth pastors over the years, and youth directors, and youth families. <laughs> My best friend is here today uh, to listen to me preach, and she can remember how we would go on youth trips, and sometimes we would only go because we'd have an <laughs> intern from somewhere else, and he was 20-something years old and good-looking, but we would go. <laughs> We would go to whatever Bible conference we needed, as long as we had a motivation, and sometimes that was a motivation. But it's those things that spark that little bit of creativity. It's those things that are going to keep our kids connected. As we continue to go through our lives, and lives get busy, and we're bogged down with homework and work, and church kind of has a tendency to slip, and then Bible reading and Bible studying kind of has a tendency to slip. And pretty soon, a year, five years, six years goes by, and our children and what they're learning changes. I have a vision for this church, and you all have heard my vision, and some of you laugh at me, and some of you think that I'm crazy. But I see a basement full of kids. I look at our kids and I see 15, 20, 30 kids we have in this congregation, if not more. And I am excited because I can remember the years when I first came here when things were kind of dwindling on all ages, not just the youth. Well, we didn't have but one or two or three kids there for a couple of years. And we used to say, boy, I sure wish we had those kids. Do you all remember that? And we have them now. So what are we going to do to keep them going? Because if we skip out and if we decide that we're too busy and that we're just not capable of doing it, then our children aren't going to have those same experiences. This Bible isn't going to mean much if they don't know what it's used for or they don't know the stories within it. When Jesus was a boy, he went to the temple and his parents left him there for two or three days. And he was all by himself, which, can you imagine leaving your child for two or three days? But more importantly, can you imagine finding your, church, your children in the temple? Well, our children aren't Jesus. And it's going to take us to be the ones to lead them. And as we leave here today, I would just invite all of you to prayerfully consider where God is calling you in your lives to reach out. Whether it be to children, or to those in need, or in mission. Remember that God calls all of us not to be bench warmers, but to share his light and his vision for all people. Thanks be to God. Amen.